Okay. Interesting. Well, now I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we move into our, uh, our scripture today. And Jema mentioned uh, these songs that stick in your head. Uh, and there are certain books that stick in your head too. And I thought we would hear this familiar story of the Magi um, through two different sources today. I'm going to start by reading the first part of the story uh, from the wonderful children's author, Tommy DePaula, and do my best to show these beautiful pictures as well. Tommy kind of interprets uh, the Magi story a little more than we hear in scripture. He gives the, the Magi names. I mean, he says that there's three of them, first of all. Um, and then we'll conclude the story um, hearing from the Gospel of Matthew. So just to, uh, just to change it up a little bit today, this is, this is a story that we've been reading to Zoe a bunch. And I know maybe there's no children with us, but there are many who are young at heart. So I hope everybody can see the, the beautiful illustrations here. So this is the story of the three wise men, according to Tommy DePaula. Long ago in the East, in lands far from one another, there lived three kings, Melchior of Arabia, Gaspar of Tarsus, and Baltazar of Saba. These wise men studied the stars. Each night they looked at the sky and wrote down where the stars were, where they had come from and where they were going. One night, a star they had never seen before appeared in the sky. Each of the kings consulted his books and found that this new star was the sign that a great king was about to be born. So each king, not knowing about the others, set out to follow the star, to find the child king and to honor him. And each carried with him a gift. Melchior took gold, Gaspar frankincense, and Baltazar myrrh. After many days and nights, the three wise kings met. They found that they were all following the same star, so they continued their journey together. But as they came near to Jerusalem, they lost sight of the star and did not know which way to go. Let us ask at the palace of King Herod, one of them said. Surely Herod will know of the birth of another great king. Where is he that has been born, the king of the Jews, they asked. We have seen his star in the east and we have come to honor him. Now Herod, who was an evil man, was disturbed when he heard this. He wished to be the only king in that land. He went to his chief priests and learned men and asked them where this child would be born. It has been written at Bethlehem in Judah, they told him. Herod sent for the three kings. Go to Bethlehem and find out all about the child king, he said. And when you have found him, come back and tell me, so I may worship him too. The three wise kings set out for Bethlehem, not knowing that Herod wanted to destroy the newborn baby. And there in the sky, once again, was the star. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. 
Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May God add a blessing to our reading of his word. We will join in song now. Tim is going to play the first two verses of We Three Kings. Amen. So I'm gonna offer a reflection uh, on my own today. And during our time in the social hour, we'll have a chance to respond and kind of pick up some of the ideas that I share. In 1925, about a century ago, the anthropologist Marcel Mauss published a book that was called The Gift. Mauss had studied the practice of gift giving in a range of different cultures, Polynesian tribes and indigenous peoples here in the Pacific Northwest. And he was interested in questions like, what does it mean to give a gift? Why does gift giving play an important role in so many cultures? Mouse's main argument is kind of a depressing one. He argued that gifts are never actually freely given. A gift, he said, was usually given to establish some connection between the object and the giver. Think about a politician who brings a fancy silver bauble and some caviar to another country's politician and then a week later calls them up to ask for a deal on oil prices. Or a little bit closer to home for me, think about new parents who are going to see their parents and bring their new baby to her grandparents for the first time along the way. They stop for some maple syrup just to thank their parents in advance for all the child care they might be helping with. But Marcel Mauss's work was also criticized. Some people thought that he was missing the most important part of gift giving. What about all those gifts which really cannot be reciprocated? The essayist Lewis Hyde wrote a wonderful book in 1980. It was also called The Gift. And in this book, Lewis Hyde talks about painting and music and woodworking and home-cooked meals and all the other creative acts that really can't be reproduced or reduced to their monetary value. Hyde writes about the community of shakers, this fascinating Christian movement, almost extinct now, the Shakers were known for their amazing energetic dancing, for their drawing and weaving and singing. And if you were an artist in a Shaker community, you were known as an instrument. That's what you were called. You were completely anonymous. Your name was never published. 
And it wasn't to be remembered or to get anything in return that you wove baskets or sang. It was simply because creativity and gift giving were the way, the best way that you knew to express your love of God. And so we come this morning to the Magi and their famous gifts to baby Jesus. And so we come aware too of all the different possibilities of how gifts can work. And so we ask ourselves, is this gold and frankincense and myrrh is it offered with the hope of something in return? Are these magi already positioning themselves for a future spot in this future king's cabinet? Or rather, were these things given by these men completely freely as a way to honor the Christ child? Either way, I think, as they knelt down before Jesus and opened their treasure chests, I think these magi would have felt something that I felt acutely this Christmas. These presents that I watched my, loves one, my loved ones unwrap, these gifts that the Magi brought from their homeland, they're never enough. In the face of God's very self shining in that manger, what good is some incense and precious metal? In the face of all my life's blessings and all the things I've learned from her, how could I possibly pick the perfect cardigan sweater for my wife? Perhaps in the end, we offer gifts in the same way that we offer prayers. Prayers are notorious for not measuring up. Language about God is known for not being able to capture everything about God's essence. And still, we try. Still, every day, every week, we pour forth language. And still we search for the right gifts for the people we love. We scour the internet. We ask secretly leading questions about shoe size or reading interests. And every Christmas we give gifts whose very inadequacy points to their glory of the source in God's love. One little story before I end. Two weeks before Christmas, Kit and I were worried about a neighbor of ours. She was an older woman who lived in the house next door with her husband, as well as their daughter and son-in-law and their grandson. Normally, this was a loud and lively household. Too many people squeezed into a craftsman bungalow. We heard lots of laughter from next door. We often heard lots of yelling, too. Then one morning, we saw an ambulance parked in front of the house. The daughter told Kit that her mom had suffered a heart attack. She didn't seem too worried. It was a small heart attack, she said, but still day after day, we didn't see the mother at the house. We didn't see her around. Finally, one day, about 10 days before Christmas, we did some Googling and we learned that the woman had died two weeks before Christmas. We still have no idea if her death was COVID related. We do imagine that her family wouldn't have gotten to see her say goodbye one last time. The days passed, Christmas approached. We thought of our neighbors and we didn't think of them enough. Christmas morning came and the house next door was so eerily quiet. And on Christmas morning, my family was given an amazing gift by one, one Reverend Barry Cammer. Okay, I did purchase this gift at the virtual bazaar and I did strongly suggest that Barry might bring it over on Christmas morning, but it was still a miracle. Hot, delicious cinnamon rolls at our doorstep, 12 of them and icing on the side. After we polished off a few and put a few in the freezer, Kit and I decided that we would bring the other half dozen over to our neighbor's house. As soon as we walked outside, we saw the man who had lost his wife. I'll call him Jason. We almost ran right into Jason standing there on his front lawn. I realized I hadn't seen him in so long. He had grown out his beard. He sort of looked like a wild Old Testament prophet. And we mumbled a few words about how sorry we were. I said we had brought over something that they might eat. Jason didn't say anything. He just pointed to the hood of his truck 
that was parked on the street in front of their house. And we put the cinnamon rolls and the icing on the hood of the truck and we walked back in. Maybe we give in the same way that we pray. Not because we usually have anything particularly special to offer, but because we need to say something and because we don't have any other way to say it. I'm so sorry. Or in the case of those magi, crouched with Mary and Joseph, cracks of light flooding into that stable, God is here. The Lord is with us. Hallelujah. Amen. We move now into our time of communal prayer, a time when we lift up joys and concerns, people and places that we wanna pray for. I think we'll do the sharing of joys and concerns like we did last week through our chat function. So if you have something that you'd like to pray for, please enter it into the chat and I will uh, repeat those prayers and lift them up and then I'll gather us all into prayer together. We continue to pray for all those places continue, uh, that, that are hit especially hard by COVID. Thinking of people in Southern California in particular. Dorothy Stryker offers a prayer for Glenna Seeley as she continues to mourn the loss of David. And I had the chance to lead Glenna and um, six of her family in a small service for David yesterday. Um, Linda Young asks for prayers for hungry children everywhere. Jamer Roberts asks for prayers for the healing of our country, both physically and emotionally. Michelle Weber asks for prayers for her mother who lives alone and celebrated this holiday season without any in-person contact. Barry Kammer asks for prayers for all the children in the world who live each day hungry for food and for love. Helen Winters offers prayers of gratitude for the life of Debbie Kimball her friend of 50 years who passed away recently in an unexpected way. Joe Pratt offers prayers that our government will continue to function during this time of transition. And George uh, Saska offers prayers for children and parents that are separated still and caged. And Tim asks for prayers for all of us to continue to have the strength to keep going. Okay, let's join together now as we gather up all these prayers written and spoken aloud as well as those uttered in the depths of our own hearts. And we go to God now. Most holy and glorious God, you are our ultimate gift giver. It is in your non-competitive love that we find our motivation and our ability to continue in this time. God, on this first Sunday of the new year, we pray for all those 
um, who weren't able to celebrate the holiday season in the ways they might have imagined. We pray for all those who continue to be on the front lines of fighting COVID, for all those who are mourning the losses of loved ones. We pray, God, for our children, for the children all around the world. We ask that you might help us act in their interests to create a future that is different than what we're living right now. God, we thank you for the glimpses of your love that still shine forth on this Epiphany Sunday for the blessings of family and friends near and far for the gifts of technology, um, even as we continue to be a little frustrated by it, for the simple pleasures, um, unwrapping presents under a tree, communicating with a loved one through Zoom or Skype, hearing a piece of music that moves us, reading a page of a story. God, hold us together through the power of your love. Keep helping us reach out even in this time. Help us to be the church that pursues justice for all people and continue to keep us healthy and safe as we move towards creating a more vibrant 2021. We pray all of these things gratefully and hopefully in your holy name as we join our voices now saying together those words which your son Jesus taught us. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We move now into a time of celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion, and we're going to prepare ourselves for this holy meal by joining together in song. Tim's going to lead us in singing, I Come With Joy. Beloved people, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, sat at a table with two disciples, and was made known to them in the simplest of ways through the breaking of the bread. Here at Arlington Community Church, we are proud to practice an open communion. We have had to be uh, very creative with the way we celebrate this sacrament over the last nine months, and we continue to do so today. If there is some bread and some juice that you have nearby, you have everything you need to join us 
in this sacrament. This table is for all people who wish to experience the presence of Jesus's love. We remember back now to that night of betrayal and desertion when Jesus was with his friends. He took bread, broke it, and gave thanks to God and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. As we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection and we wait for his coming again. All things are ready. Join with me as we taste of the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, take and drink. Holy one, we thank you for the gift of your grace that is poured out as we consume this holy meal. May it nourish us May it feed us, may it enable us to love beyond what we knew we were capable of. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue in worship now by the acceptance of our morning offering. And of course, we don't have anyone to scurry around and collect our offering in person today, but I encourage you to uh, to find your checkbook and mail off a check today as we continue to support the ministries of Arlington Community Church, as we continue to give back as a way to say how thankful we are for the ways we've been blessed. We will now sing in response our familiar song, What Does the Lord Require of You? And Tim will lead us in song. So before we sing our closing hymn, um, just a few announcements. Next week, we will be moving back towards our, uh, our video worship where we send it out on Sunday morning and you have a chance to watch it uh, whenever is convenient for you. But um, like I said in my midweek devotional this week, I think there is some value to joining together over Zoom. So we may try that uh, again at some point in the future. And I'm grateful to everyone for their continued flexibility. And it's just nice to see so many people with us on, uh, on this Sunday morning. Does anyone have a particular announcement that they'd like to lift up? I guess I also wanna say, hopefully you've marked your calendars for this already, but if you haven't, our uh, annual congregational meeting is coming up uh, as it does every year in January. And this year it's going to be January 24th uh, at 11 a.m. 
So we'll join together over Zoom, of course, and have a chance to look at uh, the next year's budget, as well as discuss a few other important matters uh, for the future of our church. Linda, anything you want to add to that? Um, yes, I just uh, wanted to say uh, thank you to the council for all the hard work this year. And we will be voting on council for next year. We'll be voting on um, uh, re some replacement positions for in endowment and uh, one very small little uh, bylaw change uh, regarding notifications uh, for, you know, how we're going to, how we notify people for, for meetings and stuff like that. We, it's a little difficult to just do mail. Sometimes it's easier to do um, uh, email. And we, so we're proposing that we would do, do both. And, um, and you'll be receiving a postcard that's going to be mailed out next week with a little short agenda on it. So that's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Linda. Okay, um, before we hear our words of blessing, we will sing our way out of worship, uh, singing together the last three verses of We Three Kings. Always glad we have that fifth verse to sing after the fourth verse. It's a little bit gloomy there for a second. Uh, thank you, Tim, for joining us today. Thanks to everybody for being with us. After I say this blessing, you're welcome to stick around. We're going to have another social hour, and I thought it would be a little more structured than last week, so I'm going to invite us to just talk a little bit about gifts, gift giving, gift receiving, and a, a chance to just share about some special gifts that we have been part of in our lives. So stick around if you can. If you have to go right after this, though, uh, we totally understand. Whenever you do go forth, hear these words of blessing. May we go forward to be gift givers, to do our best to harness that non-competitive love that God pours forth. And may the peace of Christ this year, the peace that passes all understanding, rest with you.
this day and forevermore. Amen. And the closing uh, instrumental piece I have for you is uh, a version of the traditional Spanish carol, El Decembre Congela, The Cold December. And it sounds like it's going to be <laughs> darker, uh, <clears throat> the title, but it actually is one of the most joyful pieces of music I think I've, I've ever encountered. And I offer it to you to help you find those little bits of joy buried in the deep winter we are in because they're there. That was lovely. Thanks, Tim. So like I said, uh, for those who are uh, able to stick around, I thought it would be interesting to hear a little bit about our experience of giving gifts. Um, that story I told at the end of my reflection was an experience of uh, kind of the the inadequacy of, of this gift, but also the necessity of it. And I think sometimes that combination produces the most memorable gifts that have been present in our lives, uh, whether uh, something we've received or something that we've given to someone else. And I'm curious if anybody, um, if anybody feels like sharing an experience, um, it can be from recently or it can be from earlier in your life, uh, where you have received a gift or given a gift that, um, that felt particularly memorable. Does anybody want to start us off here? Yeah, Anna Maria. Yeah. Um, I try to give the children, particularly the grandchildren, um, a hallmark ornament each Christmas. And when I was looking at the Hallmark selection for this year, there was one called uh, from the book, Go Dog Go, that we gave Teddy that book for his August birthday and he just loved it. So it was with great excitement that I saw Hallmark had put out an ornament, Go Dog Go. It's the book opened up to a particular page and then there's a, a sort of a car coming out of the page. So I was so excited when I found it and I've been waiting for Christmas, waiting for Christmas for when they opened it. So we watched them on, um, I think it was FaceTime when they opened that particular ornament and the whole family was just so excited. They just, because everyone just loved that Go Dog Go book. And they went and got the book and they found the page where the ornament had been set. And so it was just a really fun, unexpected, that they all just got so excited when they opened it. 
<laughs> so that, that was a fun thing this Christmas and our lonely Christmas here in Kensington with no one else around. It was a, a little highlight during the day. I love it. Yeah. Did you get to did you get to watch them open it or anything like that through? They, they opened lots of their presents in front of us. But yeah. What they did was when they were opening our presents, they did FaceTime. Yeah. So we could watch them opening um, the gifts we had sent. That's really nice. That's yes. Really nice. Yes. That, that was a that. Uh, what we'd have done 10 or 15 years ago with no Zoom or FaceTime, it would have been a much worse Christmas. I think that's true. Yeah, that's a great story. made it a little easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I'd like to say something. Yes, Charlie. Uh, Jesus was my greatest gift. And then Clavel of 78 years of wonderful marriage. And she is my second great gift. <laughs> well, do you want to say something? Yes, I'd like to say something. Go ahead. Uh, what I'd like to say is that, Charlie, my whole Christian life was from when I was just a little girl and my mother was the organist in the first congregational church of Soquel and it's still going now. And my father was the first lay minister and mom played the organ and led the choir. And the organ had two pedals down below that needed to be pushed. And my brother pushed one when my mother gave him a signal and I pushed the other when she gave me the signal. Now I was about five years old then. So you might say I have been raised in the good Lord's church. Amen. Amen. I love that. Thank you, Clavel. Thank you, Charlie. And, and, and you folks continue to be gifts to all of us as well. Um, Carol, were you raising your hand? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oops, she muted herself. <clears throat> you got okay. it. Now I'm good. Uh, about 15 years ago, my husband, who was a very kind and thoughtful guy, really, um, one of the most kind I've ever known, he knew I loved music. And he gave me a wonderful acoustic guitar for Christmas, something that was totally unexpected. I'd never played the guitar. I'd played the flute. But it was just a thrilling gift. And I went on to take lessons and. What and was the gift? And a guitar. And still a play the guitar. So. Automobile? The, the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great, Kara. I love when um, a gift leads you into a new kind of experience of life or a new practice. It did. I mean, I still play today. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, Elena. Mine was a birthday gift. My daughter was born on my birthday. And Linda had a son born on her birthday just one week before that. Huh. You, said, you said Linda? Yeah. So Linda, Linda and I are a, a week apart in age, exactly. And we have two children who are also a week apart in age exactly. And each of them was born on our birthdays. Wow. wow. I didn't know that. That's really cool. That's <laughs> really cool. Anybody else? I'm curious, kind of. Um, yes, I, yeah, Larry. Yes, uh, Nina reminded me of a gift that she gave me uh, shortly after we met, actually. And I still have it with it, me, and it's uh, two volumes of, of uh, songs written by Russian composers to the verses of Alexander Pushkin. And they are a very variety of them. And some of them are incredibly beautiful and some of them I don't sing 
I sang once and said never again. <laughs> that's happens. But I still have the book and I still sing many of the songs from that book. And uh, uh, probably most people don't know Pushkin, but he was the greatest Russian poet and also impossible to translate into the English language because he used so many idiomatic terms that are peculiar to Russia that we don't have any any analog for it. So people, when they when they translate it, they just make up something that's sort of Pushkinist. <laughs> but the real Pushkin is quite different. No, I still have it, and Nina and I uh, enjoy this very much. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Thanks, Larry. I'm going to do a show and tell. I'll be right back. <laughs> What show you? and tell. I'm going to see if Joe's still around. This is uh, my grandmother's family Bible, which some of you have noticed when you've come into the office. It's hard to miss. It takes up the whole kind of shelf space. And you can see it's not in the best condition. It's sort of held together. Um, but I ended up with this because I was the only uh, person in my family who, who my, my family thought would be interested in it. And it's actually been a little bit of a, a burden to schlep uh, to all the different places we've moved, uh, Connecticut, Iowa, different spots here in the Bay Area. But every time I've had to move it and pack it and put it in a new place, I've just always been uh, reminded of it. And I think it's, I'm interested in these gifts that like, like I'm always going to have this uh, and it's going to be a, a sort of a burden, but also a real blessing. And I'm interested in those gifts that are kind of both of those things. Uh, Cause I think maybe a little like a child, sometimes uh, uh, they, they get us close to the, the marrow of life. Um. You can't see me, but can I say something? This is Helen. Yeah, Helen. Hey, Helen. Hi there. Um, uh, Carol, did you want to give any kind of plug for what's happening on Thursday at four o'clock? The interviews? Oh, she's. Interviews. Carol is uh, maybe. Where is Carol? Is she gone? No, no she's no, not here. Oh, sorry, you just switched. Yeah. I was kind of hoping Nate would, would talk a little bit about that. Um. I'm happy to talk about it. So um, I guess it came back to, a, it started a conversation that Faith Formation was having a little while ago about some sort of new programming that we could offer. And we were reflecting on just all the uh, cumulative wisdom and interesting life perspectives we have stored up here in our congregation. And I think Carol came up with the idea of uh, these kind of informal interviews that we're going to try out um, with one or two people each month. And um, the potluck slot on Thursday afternoon seems like a good slot for it. And we're going to start with, uh, if they're up for it, Charlie and Clavel uh, this coming Thursday. And I think our questions, Carol, are going to be focused around faith and spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. and kind of using that lens as a way to discover more about Charlie and Clavel, but also help us all reflect on our, our own spiritual journeys. Right, right. <laughs> That's about it, right? We'll see what it, what it goes into, but uh, I think Carol's a wonderful person to ask questions. If, you, if you've known her at all, you, you know how uh, wonderfully she formulates questions. So I'm really looking forward to it. So that'll be four o'clock this Thursday. Watch for a Zoom announcement. Thank you, Helen. You're, you're like our publicist. This is really <laughs> the, the Zoom, I'll probably send out the Zoom link on, um, on Wednesday in the Wednesday update. That's probably what I'll do. Yeah. And I see Louise. Hi, Louise. Hi, hi. So mom and dad are practicing the questions. So they'll be there on Thursday. They oh, wonderful. They I was just gonna go. call you guys to check in on Wednesday, yeah. but okay, so okay. you're up for it. We're up for it. They're taking a nap now, so I'll say goodbye, and this is wonderful. Louise, See you Thursday. Louise, will you be there on Thursday too? Yes, I'll cool. be there. Okay. okay.
Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, we'll see you then. Uh -huh. Um, L Linda Jones. Yes. Um, well, I think I would like to talk about <clears throat> guides being a gift. In my life, the thing that will be the lasting gift are guides I've had along the way. I can go back, because I wasn't really raised in a church, to the University Congregational Church and Dr. Dale Turner, who was a wonderful preacher. And I remember going there in my early 20s. For many years, I was at San Damiano with Ursula, who was a tremendous guide for many years. And the people at Arlington, Shirley Bromley, Ken Barnes, and so many people who, have, who are not here now, who have modeled to me wonderful gifts. And Nate, we're getting acquainted with you as a pastor, and I appreciate so much the insights I thought this was good on the consumer <laughs> uh, message on Wednesday. So I think the lasting gift for me is really the guides who have influenced my life. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Maybe more so than most objects and, and things around the house. Yeah, people. Anybody else feel like telling a little story of a gift that you you gave or received? Uh, uh, Julie. There we go. Um, ever since I was a child, I've always felt that giving a handmade gift was, or something like that, was giving a piece of yourself. And this Christmas, Bob asked our granddaughter, said, what do you want for Christmas, Grandpa? And he he said, what I want is a trumpet concert. She's just learning to play the trumpet. And our son, one of our sons is visiting and he knows how to, he's a brass player. So they actually, she created little tickets, which she mailed to us for the concert on Christmas day in the afternoon, had, had barcodes and everything on it. And they called us up and they had a FaceTime with us. And they sat there, she got dressed up in a sparkly blouse and they played Christmas carols for Bob for Christmas and somehow that felt like that was the spirit of giving it really touched my heart that sounds wonderful oh my gosh that's amazing and, and we learned that eight notes on a trumpet goes a long way <laughs> that's great maybe that'll be a new tradition who knows maybe yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Chilton. It's great to see you, Lisa. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, I have a gift that I'm hoping to get. <laughs> I haven't gotten it yet. But uh, my daughter Lydia and her uh, husband, Dee, are having a baby this month. This year, we hope, January 20th is the due date. So Ed and I are hoping to be grandparents, looking forward to it, but it's in New York. We're hoping to go there, but with COVID, who knows? So we're looking forward to that. Our gift to come, we hope. <laughs> Lisa, thanks for sharing that. That's so exciting. And it's really coming up now. Yeah, the month is here all of a sudden. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, this has been a year or two years of, uh, of new grandkids in the ACC congregation. It's really awesome. And it's a girl. So lots of girls. Wow. Well. <laughs> right. That's right. How, uh, how, how are they doing in New York? I mean. Oh, they're in their uh, bedroom up there in their two bedroom working away on their computers, working from home, staying safe. I guess in New York, they have a, she's, I keep asking her how COVID is. And she says, where they are, there's hardly any. Evidently, there's a map in New York that shows where people are that have COVID-19. But they, she said in their area, there isn't very much. So they feel pretty safe. Okay. So I'm hoping that's true. That's good. They don't, they don't go on the subway. They, they pretty much walk everywhere. And they're planning a hospital birth? Is it? Um... I, 
I think so. Yeah. Yes, but she just told us she's now giving. Uh, she's uh, has a doctor appointment every week now, as you, as you get closer, and she gets a COVID test every time. Mm -hmm. But Ed got the phone call, so I do. I don't know if her husband's getting the COVID test too every time, every week that she goes in for her doctor's appointment. They test her. That's it. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's reassuring. I think. Yeah. yeah, there's that great hospital up there on the near Columbia. I wonder if that's where she goes. Um, yeah, was it St. Luke? I forgot. She told me, but I forgot yeah. it. I think right near St. John the Divine. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, we will continue to pray to pray for her and keep us updated. Okay, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, are we winding down? Does anybody else have a a gift story that was sparked when you thought about things today? Uh, Linda Young. Just a little one. Uh, so many people mentioning grandchildren. And um, I think as a grandparent, it's been important to me to pass on some of the family traditions with the kids. And um, I have a grandchild in Sebastopol who thinks that Christmas happens at my house, and but was not here this year. But it was really good that his parents carried on some of the stuff we did at their house and they're building their own traditions as well. But the kids in um, Texas, I haven't seen for over a year now. Uh, last time I was visiting them was November a year or so ago. And um, I sent them uh, a, a little box of Christmas cookies that were the same kind of Christmas cookies I make every year. And um, along with a little bit of candy. And uh, when Reese, who is 10, opened, I got to watch him on the video uh, uh, on Zoom open it, open up the box. And he was just all alone in his bedroom and he opened up the box and he sniffed and he says, oh, Mimi, it smells like Christmas. And so that was a cool thing to get to experience. Making somebody else happy. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And to actually see it, I mean. Yeah. That's, yeah. That is a blessing that we can see, if not share the smells through our, through our screens. That's really great. Uh, Jema. I just thought as we were talking about children and grandchildren and families and whatnot, I remembered that my aunt who's now passed away, she was 93 when she died, was an artist and a writer, uh, totally by accident. She used to make up stories for her children and then her grandchildren. And she finally produced books for those of us and binders for those of us with some of her artwork and, and her stories. And I have them. I have four of her stories. This is uh, this booklet has two, Lucy Lou the Foolish Hen and the Gremlins Who Failed. And it's full of her beautiful artwork. She did it all by hand. Mm. and put it into sleeves and gave it to us each of my sisters and I each have different stories so that we can share them but it's the kind of thing that can't be reproduced you know it's not it's not it's so personal and so special she told these stories to her children for years and years and years just by memory and then finally they convinced her to write them down and then she illustrated them it is a gift that was given to each of us uh, at Christmas time many, many, many years ago. And I just treasure them. I love that. Yeah, totally unique. Completely unreproducible. I mean, you couldn't possibly make these again. She tried to publish them, but they're just too, they're too much folk tales and not, not the kind of thing that publishers are interested in. But those of us who receive them, treasure them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I love the tradition of the shakers that I was talking about a little bit, because they were completely uninterested in like achieving fame or renown through what they made. It was all about the, the thing itself, right? It was all about the gift. And um, I think that's kind of refreshing. I know some writers who, uh, who would do well to, uh, to follow that, that example. <laughs> Um, uh, Dorothy, did you raise your hand? Yeah. 
I've been um, blessed with memories that have been brought forward by the Facebook group. I love my Dutch heritage. There have been so many pictures of Oliballen that people are making. Oliballen is a donut like a fritter. Um, Oliballen actually means oily ball. <laughs> um, deep fried fritters that um, are made traditionally around Christmas and New Year's. And um, my family made them in the past, but we're not doing them now. But um, having all these pictures come through the Facebook group have been fun. Reminders of, of Olde Ballen past. That's great. Oily ball. I'd never heard of that. Oily balls. <laughs> mm. They're Dutch. Sounds delicious. They are <laughs> way too good. Well, my friends, we might be wrapping up here. It's really good to see everybody. And we made it through another Zoom service. Thanks, Elena, for your guidance. Welcome. Like Co-pilot. I don't know what happened with the recording. I'm afraid that it, the whole first part got cut off, but whatever. Um, so we will, um, we will see each other again, hopefully, uh, if you all can make it on Thursday afternoon at four. And then um, after that, uh, with another social hour coming up soon, Susan, Jordan, and I have to figure out when that will be, but maybe we'll skip a week and we'll do uh, the 17th, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks everybody. Happy Epiphany, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Stay healthy. Miss you all. Okay, bye-bye.